everyone for coming and uh, you know hearing me blab on about this stuff uh, so uh, thank you very much I'm honored um, so I'll just I'll just start off the presentation uh, giving a brief introduction about myself where I learned this and then we'll get into the presentation so my name is Pat Moore I had learned uh, the stereotomy stuff while living in France for several years uh, in France they have this traditional apprenticeship journeyman thing that they do, that they've been doing since the 13th century. They have documented evidence of this. And it still exists uh, in modern day, 2022. Uh, and I went in uh, nearly kind of mid-2010, and I studied and did this journeyman thing uh, for several years. And at the end of it, you present this quote-unquote you know, quote masterpiece to become a fully inducted member of this guild. So I did that, and in 2014 or so, I was one of the only people to do that. Um, but anyways, part of that part of that journey, or part of that apprenticeship and learning, is of the stereotomy. And it's basically how one lays out carpentry, timber framing, but also stonework. So uh, I currently live in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, uh, Canadian, born and raised, and then went over to France and did that stuff. Now I, come, I came back and now I'm trying to teach this because I believe there's a lot of value to it. So, so there, just three things up. All right, so we'll get with the, uh, we'll set off the presentation. So the presentation, the, the, the title of the presentation I give is The Art and Science of Stereotomy and then the subtitle is uh, An Organic Holistic Technology. Uh, I was really moved by this book I read called The Real World of Technologies by this Dr. Ursula Franklin. And she was a professor, I believe, of anthropology uh, the, out of the University of Toronto. And so she has this book, The Real World of Technology, and in that book she distinguishes kind of two worlds of how we utilize technology. Not, what she says, not in the sense of computers and gadgets, but how we manufacture and produce Stuff. And in her book, she lists them or classifies one as prescriptive technologies and the other as holistic technologies. And so, just to give a brief, brief, in, to explain why I consider this a holistic. So, prescriptive technologies is, if I was to try to explain this quickly, is the idea of the assembly line. The assembly line, you know, you have you know raw material that comes in, and then you have a series of broken down steps and workers that do their part, put on the bolt, put on the gear, whatever. And at the end of this line, you have a finished vehicle, Ford Model T or whatever. Uh, and that's the classic prescriptive technology. So the, the worker themselves who are on that assembly line, they don't have to know or understand the entire, the entire process of manufacturing or producing a vehicle. They just have to understand their part, you know, whether it's push that button or put that screw in, uh, and then down the line. You know, everyone does that and down the line to get a finished product. The holistic technology, on the other hand, is where you have one person, essentially, who creates the object from a raw organic material and then and knows all the steps and procedures along the way and at the very end of it has a refined piece of furniture or something like that. So uh, most of us in this room, timber framers, are of that category where we can take, generally speaking, we can take, we can look at a tree, we can cut this tree down, hew it, do something with it, and at the end of the day, you have a house or a timber frame or something. So we have a more of a holistic understanding of the whole concept of, and, and principles of how to design, construct, use the tools, the material, that sort of stuff. That's the main difference is how she classifies or lists these types of technologies. 
So I believe that stereotomy is this holistic approach of, of knowledge. Right. So that's, that's the subject. So most people probably haven't heard this word, maybe, maybe more so now, which is great, but I've always given this definition so people can see what is the dictionary definition of the word, and then also by this, this man named Louis Maserol. Louis Maserol was a French carpenter in the 18th century, the Compagnon Carpenter, and he made, published this treatise, like this large book of stereotomy for carpenters and timber framers, and so he defines Stereotomy as the art of representing object, objects in section, elevation, and plan in order to cut them out. Uh, the dictionary.com version, uh, the technique of cutting solids like stone or wood to specify forms and dimensions. Mm -hmm. Kind of vague. Uh, <clears throat> you'll see as we go, when, when we get later on or near the end of the presentation, these definitions will make a lot more sense. So stereotomy, what you're really doing is you're taking a look at, you have a, let's say, an object here in your mind, and you're trying to section this or look at it from multiple perspective to try to define it two-dimensionally. So this is just a great you know, example of you have this object, and by representing it two-dimensionally on, on its three surfaces or four surfaces or whatever, you can combine these three views to recreate that shape. That's the essence of it. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, what's happening in the brain because like a lot of the sciences and arts, there's certain parts of the brain that deal with, uh, you know, math or learning, or music, stuff like that. So here's a breakdown of the brain. Um, there's this part of the brain at the top called the parietal and that's the part of the brain that deals with visual spatial mapping. And so when we deal with stereotomy or we're dealing with trying to look at drawings, two-dimensional drawings, and look, try to visualize it in 3D, or looking at a joint, like a mortise and tenon, try to visualize this three-dimensional thing, this is the part of the brain that's working. And so, a lot of the people who take workshops with me, they, they feel like their eyes are kind of melting, or their brain's melting through their eyes. That's the part that's like really being worked. It's, your brain's a muscle, right? You just kind of work on it. In 1987, there was this uh, developmental psychologist named Dr. Howard Gardner, and he came up with this theory of multiple intelligence. And I'm showing you this because uh, I think it, you know we understand now more than before how intelligence can come in many forms, right? So, uh, so he has this theory that intelligence comes in all these forms. And for us, or for people who are interested in stereotomy, who are interested in drawing and trying to draft these three-dimensional objects, we are focusing on this section of this intelligence in um, Most of my education, most of our educational system really focuses here on this section. And I think there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's important to see other aspects of intelligence in society other than just one. You know, you can't, you know, in some ways, like I think Einstein says it, right? Like if you judge, uh, a tree, or you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll go forever thinking it's dumb. You know, it's one of those things, if we always just judge people by this aspect, we're missing the rest of, of intelligence. And so for, for us, or people who are in this world of stereotomy and, and, and timber framing and construction, we're, we're pretty good here, for the most of us. Visual hands-on learners. So to give a definition of a little bit of this form of intelligence, so this is Dr. Howard Gardner's definition. And so the working concepts of, of that is uh, people who possess this form of intelligence can, for example, think of a location or a space that they're not in and replicate its spatial ability, or qualities. And when they do replicate a space, they're able to do so in a three-dimensional format. Moreover, they can think in terms of space and how they can relate to it, like a fly sitting on a wall and observing it. And one of the best examples I can give to help define that a little bit more is if you give directions to somebody, you know, I, to get to the hotel, okay, you can almost kind of close your eyes and go, okay, you turn left at the lights, you go a mile down the road, you turn right at McDonald's. You're kind of doing this thing in your mind where you're seeing the, the three-dimensional world, right? And you're kind of trying to explain that. Well, that's the part of the brain that's working, and that's the intelligence that we're dealing with. So some people are really good with that. 
And so to give, just to warm up your brain a little bit for the presentation, I got a couple of these little uh, IQ tests <clears throat> that deals with this intelligence. So I'll let you look at this and see if you can come up with the answer. You're welcome to, you know, just scream it out if you want. D. D. All of those. Yeah. More than one. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. D. D. Sorry. So I'll give the answer. D. The answer is D. Yeah. So if we take this object on the left, this is rotated to this. So it rotates 90 degrees clockwise. That's that rotation. Therefore, then this object rotates 90 degrees clockwise. So which one of those? Yeah. So they're all the same object, but it's the rotation <coughs> that, they're, that they're looking at. So it's kind of, it has to be on the same plane, the right to left. Yeah. Okay. Not that you could rotate it this way. You can. See. Yeah, but this is this ah. is this is the question. This is rotated to that. So which in relation then to which one of these? Okay, yeah, get the gist of it a little bit? All right, I got two more, so we'll get warmed up. Then. <coughs> so, here's another one. Don't worry about the spelling mistake. I'll be getting it here. seconds. All right, seems a little bit more iffy on the group there. Yeah. Um, so I'll give the answer. One and three. One and three. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if it could be more than one. Yeah, one and three. One and three, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, one of the ways that people, well, one of the, one of the, one, the way I see it is like, look at the cubes and, I, and the relations of each cube in relation to another, and I try to, I, so you pick a, like a mental 3D image of this and you try to match which one of those with the proper orientation. That's just the way I did it. Yeah, does that make sense, one and three? Yeah, okay, I got one more, and then, and then we're on. I'll give it a few more seconds. But in the meantime, uh, there's this relationship between these two objects, right? So you have, let's say, let's say a plan view and an elevation view. So these two go together. They're one of the same. Therefore, this plan view goes to which one of these elevations?
We're good on getting the answer? Yeah? Okay. W. W is the answer. So they give you right off the bat that there's a color coding doesn't necessarily have to match. But then again, we don't know if the side of this red part, this vertical side is purple. Like we just make, you make that assumption that these go together. But the, a lot of people will instantly take the color coding of this and match it with E. Right, that's the instant kind of easy kind of thought process. But in fact, it's W. And so you can count out, I think someone said, count out the edges. That's what I was And then you can count out the flat sections, or even the bevel. And so you can see here on this elevation, you have a bevel here and a bevel at the top. And that's represented uh, by this intersection here, basically like a little hip. So this, the corner there is the intersection of these two bevels coming together. So you have a bevel at the very bottom and the top there. So when we're looking at this one, you can see that there's a bevel on this layer and the very top. So you can count one, two, three, five. One, two, three, four, five. And can T not fulfill the criteria if we imagine that the negative space on the bottom is actually a positive space as it would be in O? You lost me on that one. <laughs> so T and W are the only ones that fulfill like a single unit in the center? And if you look at O, you would that the second tier up is a positive space. So in T, oh, I see you might go in and also fair no sky outside condition. Gotcha. From here, I can't see the diagonals between the corners, so I'm just oh. treating it as. So you're saying O might have a, an inverted pyramid inside? No, no, just that the second is red and then there's a negative space. Oh, it's, it's white. Right. So in the T, it seems to be bumped up, which would imply from elevation that there's actually a space in there. Ah, yeah. Gotcha. yeah, for this tier. So the second yeah. tier is double. Right. Yeah, so there's three tiers, though. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a good thought, though. Yeah. That's a good thought. Yeah. All right, so we're good. So they did a little bit of a warm up. So there's that part of the brain thinking in 3D, trying to understand these concepts. Can we make these in black and white. What's that? Can we make these in black and white. So one of, one of the practices that we do when we, when we first start learning stereotomy is we learn about simple objects and shapes and we unfold these shapes. So for example, if we look at the shape of a cube, and this is one of the very first projects that we see, is that we have this three-dimensional cube shape thing and we, we can unfold it. And the, uh, this unfolded version of the cube is called the net the net of a, of a cube. And so by practicing that idea, you're just exercising the mind, really, that's what you do. So, and as we progress in these exercises, they get ever more complex, from you know, to a pyramid shape, irregular pyramid, to just intersecting cones, or you know, spheres, stuff like that. So th it's a really good mental exercise for, for objects and shapes. And so to give you an idea, here's a little video of, of the idea of a net. Now, the, when the video plays, it's going to, as, it, as this thing kind of comes back up into, into its shape, it, it morphs. But you'll get the idea. As soon as it comes together, it'll create a shape, and then you'll see it unfold. Right. So forget this first part. So here you have looks like maybe a soccer ball or something, then the soccer ball can get unfolded, and then there's the net of the soccer ball. Okay, and then now it, when it comes back, it's gonna distort into another object, okay, with like tetrahedron or something like this, and then now it unfolds into the net. So, so we learn how, how can we break that down? And so when it's really handy, performing those exercises uh, that you'll see in the next slide, or a couple slides over. Uh, so here's one of these such exercises that we do, where we have this, it's a kind of a, you know, everything's on this drawing, but, but here's a plan view, let's say, of a house. And around the perimeter, the darkened line are, let's say, the walls of the house. And then, you know, it might have a ridge in here, there's a valley and a hip, and there's maybe a couple other hips in there. But what we do with this object, do we see this, through, this three dimensional thing, is that we slice it. We start slicing this up. 
we slice it here on a diagonal, we slice it there, essentially along these, each one of these dotted lines. We section it. And then we take those sections and we rotate them down so we can see what's the elevation view at this point. So for example, uh, this section, if I was to make the section cut right along that line, I take that and I rotate it, so here it is there. So here's, we would say, would be your valley. This line is the line that goes from the peak down to the corner. <coughs> this line on the opposite side goes from the peak down to the corner there. So there's that one triangle. And then all these other triangles are, let's say, raptor elevation views or other views of me sectioning it up. And then we take all this information, the combination of the plan view and elevation views, essentially real lengths, and we create this thing up here. And that's the net. And so now here, what you're looking at are the roof surfaces, let's say, for your sheathing or something like that, your plywood. The real value lengths and angles of the plywood. So we can take that object and we can cut around the perimeter and then refold it to make the shape of the house there, whatever that object is. And that's really handy. Why? Because when we start to design something, a house, that's what we're doing. You have all these shapes in your mind, and you have all these triangles and pyramids or whatever, flat surfaces, curved surfaces, and you're solving how does this surface interact with that surface? How does that shape interact with this shape? How does that form interact with this form? And by doing these exercises, it becomes clearer and clearer in your mind to know how can I solve for that. So having done these little exercises that we looked at, knowing things about the net, elevation views, stuff like this, let me give you this question. What do you think you're looking at in this drawing? <laughs> the intersecting columns. Coffee filter. Coffee filter, nice. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> Never had that one. So, yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> two intersecting cones. Okay, fair, yeah. So, um, how do you know they're, they're two intersecting cones? What tells you, what's the information in the drone that's telling you that they're two cones? I don't know, I just follow oh, where they split. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the, the lower, the bottom one, you can see actually it's folded into a cone. Okay. So okay. that, that kind of like a party hat look. Okay. Uh, you and and then the maybe you assume the other one, the triangle, maybe that's a three dimensional piece. Yeah. What about the upper white one? The whole box. Okay. Yeah. The whole uh, show you they're intersecting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like, in one way, if I eliminate this, like if I eliminate all these three other views and you see just that, one might think they're pyramids or something, right? They're not necessarily columns. But then when I add this view, we know that, okay, this thing is round at the base. Therefore, it's a cone. So your mind is taking these two objects and, and putting them together to, a, to form a 3D object. That's what your brain is doing. And then what's over here on the, on the right are the net, the <coughs> unfolded surface of both cones, one of which has holes through it for this one. right? And you can see that the holes are not circular. They're kind of like egg-shaped or parabolas or something or whatever shape those are because it's coming in on an angle. So there's, the, there's that object out of metal. So there's the, 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 the elevation view, essentially, and then there's your plan view. Okay. And oftentimes when I show that, some, some people will be like, well, that's stupid. Why would you ever, no one ever does this. Do you ever build this? No, you stupid idiot. You know, like, <laughs> oh, man, come on, like, you're missing the point here. Like, the point is not, yeah, we're not gonna build this, but they're exercises. It's like, why do you go to the gym? Why do you wanna stay healthy? I don't know. So, similarly, we do these as mental exercises. You make the cones but this so was built. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, in a, in a little metal object, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. What I'm saying, yeah, is it's a construction, because you know, the carpenter or timber frame, they go, well, yeah, nobody would build a roof with two pyramids going through it. Yeah, there are, whatever, I guess, but it's, a, it's an exercise. That's yeah, that's what I thought when I learned Pythagoras for the first time. <laughs> no one's ever going to use that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah, so maybe similarly, you know, you can see these exercises, and then, but it's like a tool, you know, once you have that tool, you're like, oh, now you can find applications for the tool. And then at some point in your life, like, how did I have my, live my life without this tool, you know? <laughs> it's one of those things. Okay, so there's kind of the introduction and the idea of what stereotomy is, all right? So the next part of this presentation is I want to show you what does what's called a stereotypical drawing look like. We, we've seen it kind of briefly before, but I want to show you what a, what, a, what a working drawing looks like. This is a photo out of a book published in the 1700s by this carpenter, uh, Nicolas Fourneau, and he was one of the first carpenters in France to, to publish about stereotomy for carpenters. And so stereotomical drawings consists of different types of, of drawings. So we have, it, there's a combination of what's considered orthographic drawings or projection. There's architectural drawings, so we can include architectural details like you have a, you know, like a bullseye window. Uh, we have a, a perspective view, excuse me, of the, of the building. Uh, or orthographic, you can see we have plan view, we have elevation views, and then also we have the kind of the working part of the drawing, which is right here, this part. But all of it goes together. So this section right here is an individual component, specifically this curved hip. We take that component and you can make an elevation view of it. And by doing so, it gives you the information to then lay out on your material, your stone, wood, timber, whatever. And so stereotypical drawings are also working drawings, meaning we actually take a timber and we place it on that drawing and transcribe information onto our piece to cut. So that's why we don't have, there's not a lot of drawings kind of left over because they get so kind of beat up and used and abused and they actually just get thrown out. Because once the thing's made, a lot of people, what's the point of keeping this really complex drawing? So, so I want to show you now, uh, so modern types, or modern uh, drawings. So here are some Japanese carpenters working away at their stereotypical drawings. And this is what we do in 2022, and when I was living in France, this is what we did once a month at least, uh, and essentially every evening from 8 to 10. You take a sheet of MDF, and you lay it right on the floor, and you start drawing out your task model, your, your mental exercise. Here's some Japanese carpenters working, and then here's what I did for several years in France, where you have a workshop, you have carpenters laying up either multiple sheets of MDF together, and you work out this big drawing. And you can see in the background there are all these exercise, well, or these exercises, uh, these scaled down models. And by doing that, that you get better at something. I mean, how weird is that? You know, practice and get better at <laughs> so, uh, so these are modern examples of what we do today, 2022. Uh, now, I want to show you some historical examples. So what they did back then, OK? So here's a photo of a stereotypical drawing from the medieval period, I believe, the 13th century out of Wells Cathedral. So the stone carvers, back in those times, would have laid it out just like you kind of see on plaster. They would have had a big floor and they would have lined plaster, like concrete, and they would etch into the floor their drawings. And stone carvers specifically call these types of floors a tracing floor, because it's on that floor that you trace everything out. Now, did anybody, anyone read that book, uh, Pillars of the Earth, by Ken Follett? Kind of a good book, yeah. And in there, there's he briefly talks about Bob the Builder, or I think one of his sons, or whatever, in the in the floor tracing stuff out. Uh, anyways, it's, so there's a so on this drawing, the mason or the carpenter will draw a section, let's say, of a cathedral or a church or whatever. Of course, they're not going to draw the entire cathedral up; that's massive. But they'll draw sections of it. So I have a couple other shots of this tracing. Is it drawn to a specific scale? Full size, usually. Yeah, full size. Uh, back in the you know medieval period, but as technology, so like in the eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, and especially now, uh, the technology advanced where we can do scale drawings. Yeah. So there's another shot of it. it doesn't look anything special, kind of rough. Uh, but I have a couple of close-ups of it. 
So here's a close-up looking right on the top of part. Again, you can see it's just etches in the floor. And what they would have done then is they would, let's say, if I wanted to build a vault of the cathedral, they would draw maybe a quarter of that vault or a section of that vault, figure out all the stereotomy, figure out uh, the templates, specifically for carvers, they would find templates that they can then give to the stone carver, to everybody else, and carve me this template to this face, carve me this template to this face. And by doing that, you get the stone. Um, but once, once they do their drawing, they would just replaster over it and then do another drawing. So often these tracing floors have multiple layers of plaster. And so you can kind of see here, it's kind of chipped out. Have they uh, shot lasers through? And yeah, so, exactly. So this, in well, so this specific tracing floor, there was uh, a couple of students I don't know, doing their thesis, an architectural student doing their thesis. There's a YouTube video about it. It's pretty cool. They, they laser scan it, photogrammetry, all this crazy stuff, light, and they digitize it, okay? Um, they get a digitized version of it, so here it is. So there's so many lines and etches and stuff like this, but what, what was kind of fascinating, no, no surprise, in one way, is that they were able to find a section of a vault. There's a plan view of a vault, this square. And then this arcing here is a, perhaps an elevation view of that vault. And so the stone carver's figuring out, like the master mason is figuring out the templates. And the students, from what I understand, like perhaps I misunderstood it, but they were able to link this drawing, this exact drawing, to one of the vaults in the cathedral. So there's the vault in the bottom left, the cloister vault in the Rome cathedral. And there's the working drawing that they used for the stonework. This is the best example of a tracing floor that I'm able to find. There's a couple other ones, but there's, they're just kind of small pieces of versions of it. So are, there, are there examples of like lesser quality yes. versions of that? Where yeah. Like, yeah, I got some here. Yeah. So I go with the best and I'll work my way down. So then the next best example I was able to find is out of York Minster in the UK. And so there's two photos here. You can see on the left photo, this is the tracing floor. And on the right side are these templates I was telling you about. So these are the templates that the stone mason was trying to find and solve and then pass out on to another stone carver's guitar. And you can kind of maybe appreciate the importance of these templates. Because once they figure out the tracing floor, they, they figure all that stuff out, they replaster over it, and then they lose the template. And it's like, oh my gosh, now I gotta do all this work. I gotta redo my drawing to solve for this template. So they would, chances are they would have like a master template locked away in some, some part of you know building site that's strictly for the stone, the master mason or his apprentices. And then you can almost kind of see then this like secrecy around that I don't want to be teaching too many people this stuff because now I'm you know teaching my competitor. And so this, you know, they you know, back in those times the master mason or carpenter kept this to themselves and would only you know, generally speaking would pass it over from father to son or grandfather to father to son. Family. And so there's a family, there's often a family lineage of stone carvers or master carpenters. Because it, it just basically, incur, uh, you know, uh, you have guaranteed work, right? Intellectual property. If, <laughs> true, true, you know, trade secret. Yeah. You know, the, the essence of a, of a trade secret. Yeah. So here's another shot of that tracing floor. I think it kind of looks like a, you know, window opening or something with some tracery. But it, similarly, they, they digitized it. They took, you know, laser scans of it. And so there it is there. Yeah, and you can see that they, they think the tracing board dates between 1360 to 1500. Then I have a couple of other examples, smaller versions or less best examples, I guess. This is another tracing floor out of Spain, St. Catherine's Chapel in two week, uh, at the two-week cathedral in Spain. And this tracing floor dates to the 12th century. This one's out of uh, the, the, the St. Etienne Cathedral in Bourges, France. Similar time period, 12th, 13th century. 
And in this case, they just drew it right onto the stone instead of a flat surface floor. You know, really etching it, you know, writing in stone. Would that have the same vertical orientation as what was actually built? Uh, from my understanding, yeah, the full size uh, drug. Yeah, so that might be a window or something, an opening. So there's some modern and historical examples of stereotypical drawings. And I'll kind of finish this section off with this quote. So in a 2012 editorial in the New York Times, the late American architect Michael Graves emphasized that hand sketching is a must. Quote, architecture cannot divorce itself from drawing, no matter how impressive the technology gets, he wrote. Quote, drawings are not just end products. They are a part of the thought process of architectural design. And furthermore, without the simplicity and directness of the relationship between pen and paper, he is concerned that architects will lose the ability to develop and visualize ideas in their minds. Quote, replacing hand sketching with other technologies will limit architects instead of expand their capacity, he says. And this is a quote that's coming out of Autodesk. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what we're trying to say here is that there's a, there's a direct relationship between mind and hand, and how humans learn by doing physically. And, and your brain is more involved. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so now I want to show the kind of history, as briefly as I can, because there's so much. It's like the, the history of Roman Empire. There's so much you can't talk about it in and out. But I want to just give you some like, context of the history of stereotypes. So uh, this section, I'm going to go as far back as I possibly can. <clears throat> so you bear with me in that part. But then we'll get later on the Roman and the Egyptian time period and stuff, and you can see better examples. But uh, the earliest, what I'm trying to portray here, the earliest examples I'm going to sh show you is how there's this innate ability or this innate uh, things that humans do in tracing or drawing uh, three-dimensional objects on two-dimensionally. So whether it's like a cave painting or something like that. Okay. So the first kind of etchings that humans have rediscovered is on this little shell. So the etchings themselves, not the shell, but the etchings, they they think is about 500,000 years old. And it's coming out of Indonesia. And they think it was done with intent because of how hard it would have been to etch into it. Uh, and they think it was done with a shark too. I don't know how they figure that out, but these people are a lot smarter than I am. So. That's just a guess. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. whatever, yeah. yeah. So there's the earliest known etching. Cool, okay. Bear with me on that. But, uh, this is a fragment of a little rock, and this is uh, the earliest known um, drawing by humans. And they are uh, maybe some kind of version of a human, maybe not us now, but they figure the drawing dates to 73,000 years old. Or no. Okay, cool. But, uh, uh, and then we'll fast forward to the, some of these cave things. So then we have some of these cave paintings where uh, this is out of Southeast Asia. And this, this cave painting is about 40,000 years old. And you can see you have some kind of like animal down at the bottom there. You, you, have, you have handprints and I don't know, some other stuff there. I don't really know about it, but um, my point is that basically ever since humans were humans, we've been drawing two-dimensionally something that actually is a three-dimensional object. So this is the uh, oldest known example of figurative art. Rock art, excuse me, figurative art. Uh, here's a really good example. Of, uh, well, out of northern Spain, and this is 35,600 years old. And I guess uh, I quote this uh, little quote that says, uh, most folks didn't think prehistoric men had the intellectual ability to generate any type of artistic expression. So I guess that kind of throws it out of the water. Okay, so there's some, you know, we're not really about. All right, so this, uh, this is the earliest known architectural drawing. And it's not blurry, it's a close-up of a rock. But this is uh, a, a, a carving of a rock out of near Barcelona. And it dates to 14,000 years ago. And so they think there's some, uh, I'll, I'll kind of explain to you here. So there's 
these indents here, and they think that that was a campsite. And then you can see there's a perimeter that looks like kind of a rhomboid or something shape, like that. And the researchers believe that the person that was doing this work was depicting depth to the drawing. Kind of way, way before Van Gogh. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of a fascinating idea, like, okay, how can we make this, this two-dimensional surface look 3D, right? So that's 14,000 years old. Okay, so fast forward a little further, then we get into uh, the, Meso the Mesopotamian era, where on, this is a statue out of the London Museum, and on one of these statues is this floor plan of a temple, and all associated with this floor plan, I don't know where on the statue, but there's a scale. So they figured out if I can take this measurement and times it by my scale, I can get the real size of this building. So there's a there's there's what we do today, right? Um, but that's ancient Mesopotamia. That's the 21st century BC. Fast forward a little further, faster, we get to the, excuse me, the, the Egyptian time period. So the Egyptians drew their drawings on papyrus, papyrus, I don't know how they pronounce it, but papyrus. Paper, papyrus, thank you. And I often ask the group, so we see some kind of floor plan, but what do you think these yellow parts are? They're, yes, when I first looked at that, I thought stairs, but they're doorways. They're doorways that have, like, it's, an, it's a section cut that's been folded down so you can see the, the width and the height of the door. There's, here's the stairs. Yeah. Uh, this is the 12th century BC. So they have a couple of examples of it. So here's another example of a floor plan of a, of a tomb. Same thing, so there's your doorways folded it down. So the idea of taking like an elevation view on these drawings and rotating it, folding it down, dates, you know, as, as we have evidence to the Egyptian period. And then the Romans, of course, so fast forward further, the Romans, they built all kinds of drawings on, on walls to depict uh, cities, towns, landscape, all this sort of stuff. With a scale. How big? Do you know how big these? Uh, this was. This is these two. These two uh, slides go together. So. And it was a large wall. I'm not sure what the size of the wall is, but it depicted a section of the town uh, to show where like residential parts are, the amphitheater, and you know all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And now it's just a fragment. So I guess a big tower or whatever. So that's this dates back to the year 200, 200 AD. And then since basically the fall of the Roman Empire to, I don't know, medieval times, like 15th century or something, I think they, there's a period in time called the Dark Ages. I don't know exactly when that is, but there wasn't a lot of stuff that they were able to find in terms of drawings, or that I was able to find. But they did, I was able to find this drawing. This is one of the most famous, more well-known drawings of the medieval Dark Age period. And this is the Plan of St. Gaul. Um, it's a medieval architectural drawing of a monastic compound uh, dating from the early 9th century. And this is the only surviving major architectural drawing from the 700 year period between the fall of the Roman Empire and the 13th century. So my point here in showing all of this is that basically ever since ever, we've been drawing stuff out. And there's an important, because we have this, um, this ability in our mind to do that. And, a, and I think now more than ever, it's important to exercise that. Okay, so we got that. Um, and then now I want to show you some real examples of the use of stereotomy. And so we're going to go historically, and then we're going to come, you know, into time. So I want to show you the idea of the, probably the basic or primitive use of stereotomy in that creating a, an archway. And so there's kind of two ways that humans created archways. One of which is this corbelling technique. Where he didn't require any stereotomy, he just the stone above projected a little further than the stone below, and then by doing that, you can create this opening. But you couldn't make big spans; you can make little spans. Uh, and then it wasn't until the development or the invention of what's considered a true arch, 
So the one on the left here, where the stones are cut specifically, that then they can widen the width of the opening. So here's a couple examples of these corbelled arch techniques. This is with the oldest bridge in Europe and built in the 1300s, uh, 13 to 1200 BC. Uh, this is found in Greece. So pretty primitive, but you get the idea, right, how they do this corbelling technique. Here's another example uh, out of Indonesia with the brickwork. And then, you know, this, this, this is a famous bridge using this corbelling technique. And again, you can see how those spans were too great. They were quite narrow. And then one of the good examples of the corbelling technique, and then with the the, with the, uh, the stones being cut out to, to form an arch way of some kind. So this is like this arch in the 1200s. Um, uh, where is this one? This one is in India. Uh, the tomb of Nazir Uddin Mahmud. Sorry, I really brutalized that. And the preceding image, what was that? The what? The preceding image of the bridge. Oh, this one, yeah. Uh, let's see, that was... Uh, Southeast Asia. The bridge was built in the 12th century during the reign of King Yayavaman VII. Sorry. You're doing great. So far. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Oops. So, Alright. Yeah. So, yeah, so you got the, this corbellian arch technique, which didn't require stereotomy, but then this true arch technique, which enabled human civilization to then start making bigger spans, bigger you know vaults. Uh, this is the oldest known true arch, where again, like the the true arch is where individual stones are cut to a pre seemingly precise angle to be assembled into this structural component. So this one dates to 21 BC in ancient Iraq. The Romans were pretty famous for using this semicircular arch to creating their infrastructure, like aqueducts, uh, fortresses, you know, military application. And the Romans actually, in fact, apparently took it from the Etruscans, which was an older civilization in Italy. And the Etruscans built semicircular archways with stereotomy, with individual stone true arches, mostly or mainly underground or partially underground, because there's the amount of outward thrust that, that's employed on a semicircular arch that the Etruscans, they used the ground to support that. Whereas the Romans, they, they, they figured with their engineering, they could figure, well, we can raise this up, uh, but required large, thick masonry walls. So in Roman architecture, we have very thick buttresses to support that load. And so that's why Romanesque architecture is kind of like dim and gloomy and dark and wet and no one, you know. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, just like, you know, old churches are just like always like musty and stuff. Just like sewer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so the the Romans, uh, with so if I was to take this this semicircular archway and extrude it, like you know, lengthwise, I create a barrel vault. Okay, and then I can take this barrel vault. Say I take two of these barrel vaults and I intersect them, you know, perpendicular to each other. I create a groin vault. And the groin vault, you know, they, you can make a bigger span because most of the load was coming down into the piers now, instead of into the walls. There's just some photos of how the Romans would have constructed these barrel vaults. And so I want to show you some examples of these really good examples of Roman barrel vaults and groin vaults utilizing stereotomy. So here's a church, um, I think in Spain. I got my notes here. Uh, yeah, uh, the Church of St. Martin of Tours in, um, in the province of Palencia, Spain, built in the 11th century. And so here you can see this barrel vault going this way, I believe for the nave of the church. And then right above, at the very end, if you look up, this is where you get to the dome. And so there it is. And you can see how I, I, you know, some of these, these are individual stones cut precisely to make this kind of spherical shape. In the corners, you can see these these elements, I believe, called the squinch. A squinch. Um, and then you can see uh, these elements of the windows where they're, in fact, uh, splayed out to allow more light to come in. And all of those components, all those piece stones are cut precisely on these angles to support the structural load above. 
throughout the 11th century. Here's another good example, again, around the 11th century with the barrel vault, the groin vault, uh, and then the rib vault here. So the Roman stone carvers and masons figured out did how to you know, do all that stone work in this, with using this, this stereotomy. So I got a close up of the window on the left there. So there's an above the absent, I think, of the church. So there it is. So there's the stone where you have the semicircular arch here, so it's curved this way, but it's also curved that way. And then you can see in the window of here, the semicircular arch that's, that has basically a cone shape coming out to allow more light. Roman uh, arches and groin vaults. Um, the Romans with their famous king post truss, you can see that above there. I always like to point that out. Um, I'll fly through some of these here. But here's a, one of the best examples of Romanesque architecture uh, out of Burgundy, France. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, this is for the outstanding masterpiece of Burgundian Romanesque art. This is just a, I found, this is a fascinating arc, uh, archway that I found in, uh, out of Iraq. This is the largest single span of unreinforced brickwork. And just to give you perspective, there's a man or someone standing at the very top there. Do you know how old these are? This is, yeah, well, third to sixth century uh, Persian monument. It looks like an elliptical arch. Yeah. Is it still there? It's still there, yeah. So I think here's a modern photo of it. They rebuilt portions of it, from what I understand. I think, you know, that part of the world is always being bombed, right? Yeah. Yeah. They got, a lot of it was destroyed during war, basically, yeah. Um, so, so we have this ability to create these barrel vaults and archways and these domes. And so I want to show you just a, very briefly uh, the, these dome structures. And the dome is not something new. It's been around since, these are some beehive domes that have been around since the third century. They use, in this case, they use a score belling technique. But the, the, one of the best, and that dates to the sixth, sixth uh, century BC. The best example of the dome that was ever find in the oldest is out of this place in northwestern Syria. So when you walk in, you just go right to the very end and you can see this, this dome here. So this is before those other previous examples, Romanesque examples I've shown you, but in the year 460, this part of the world discovered, okay, we can cut these stones very precisely using the stereotomy. Like an eagle, like, looks like an eagle hoop, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have a couple of examples of these groin vaults. I'm gonna fly through these because my presentation's a bit, I got more than an hour and a half one, but I wanna show, just show you some of these groin vaults uh, out of Rome. Here's the, the oldest known groin vault where you, again, you have this barrel vault going this way and then coming through or other barrel vaults forming this shape. And the intersection is a, what's considered a true ellipse. And in this case, uh, they didn't use stone, but they just plastered over it, had this like Roman concrete kind of stuff. But they had the idea, you can see in the year 200, they had this notion or idea of how this can work. And then fast forward for 300 years in this place, uh, the future tomb of Theodore the Great in 520. Right inside, you have a groin vault with individual cut stones. So this is a bit of a this blip in architectural history. Out of nowhere comes this these people are, that had this really good understanding of stereotomy, because it was then you know it wasn't for hundreds of years later that we see this occur again. So for people who've taken, I, I, I give these little growing ball classes where we make this on paper. So people who've taken that class, this brings about how we how we solve for it. Different types of growing vaults that we that humans have developed over time. Um, the Gothic arts, the fan vaults, and I'll show you a little bit about about this. <coughs> um, so with the growing vaults, they figured well if we make the 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 intersection, the ellipse, the actual archway. What's, kind of, what's now considered a rib vault, uh, you can make bigger spans, higher, higher ceilings, wider spans. So this is one of the 
that's, I think, the, er the earliest known example of a brick fault. Uh, in UK, here, 10, uh, 1093. And you can see there, there's like, there's like a lips being reinforced with, that's the structural arch. Actually, I think this is, excuse me, this one's the oldest, 1056. And then out of those rip vaults, we were able to develop what's, what they call stellar vaults. And this is out of the uh, Eli Cathedral, and it was built in 1321. And so in between these rip vaults, so they, they fill it up with other stones. So here's a plan view of it. And they just kind of, and that's the, I guess the stellar vaults, they call it. Correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, um, and my favorite and the best, well, best example, I believe, of a groin vault, a rib vault is out of here, in Valencia, Spain, built in 1482. <coughs> so what we're looking, we're looking into the, into the vault from down below, like put your camera looking up. <coughs> um, and you can see that we have these like spiraling columns that come up and then flower into the, the rib vaults. I got another shot of it. Here. So 1482, yeah. And what's actually quite fascinating about this, is, is, as opposed to our previous examples, is the infill in between the rib vaults are of cut stone. And the infill of other, the other examples I've shown are just often plaster and like rough, rough marble, like rubble mortar or whatever, or uh, stone. Whereas these, they're, they're precise cut stones. So I get this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. So it's a really fascinating example of, of the, the rib vault. And out of the rib vault, we were able to develop these sorts of other vaults, the span vault. This is the out of the Gloucester Cathedral built in 1351. Um, however, the earliest, which is kind of a hybrid, this is a this is a fascinating one. This one here, built in the 1100, you know, 1200 It's a mix of like this fan vault and stellar vault. Uh, combination groin vault thing. So you can see here where you have this intersection from here from one pendant to the other, there's there's that rib vault here. You have the stellar components in here, and then you have this fan vault, this vault occurring here. And also the infill is filled with cut masonry. It only took 40 years to build like that? Yeah, something like that, yeah. I thought it was 40,000 people doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so just one person. <laughs> In some ways, yeah. Yeah. I mean with the modern technology of CNC's and like six axis CNC, like you know, why can't we do that? Yeah. Um, and then I have all these it's kind of these wild, fancy looking uh rib vaults. This was out of the Ladislav Hall in Czech Republic. This is a fascinating one in that it's got these like organic curves to it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, so people are familiar with Lori Smith and, and his work. There's the daisy wheel right above the ceiling there. So you can go check this out. This is a modern photo of it, but historically, or the, or one of the oldest examples is here. And I guess in between there, in between the infill, it was painted. What was that one called? Uh, this is out of a Vladislav Hall in the Prague Castle. Yeah, and it, I mean, if we, if we can kind of analyze it a little bit, you have this rib ball that come, comes up, splits, this one goes around into the, the, the flower there, and it does whatever, and it comes back through into this here. All that made out of stone, cut stone. So here's a shot of looking, you know, if you lay down on the floor, look up, there's that, there's that shot. And so my point in, all, in showing the kind of stone stuff is that the ability of, I mean, the evolution of stereotomy enabled us to construct some of Europe's and or the world's, you know, cathedrals and churches and abbeys and you know, castles, fortresses, a military application to it. So these are just some examples of these of these places in Europe that utilize stereotomy. So this one, this is a great one 
Chateau de Chanceau, built by, or you know, designed by Philibert de Lhomme. If anyone knows uh, this man, fascinating history. Uh, he was a stone mason, his dad was a stone mason, and he learned stereotomy, published a book about architecture, you know, five volumes of architecture. Um, and he was well known for creating these types of squinches. So here's the Wells Cathedral that I've shown with the, with the tracing floor in the beginning. There's the York Minster Cathedral, and then uh, inside the cathedral you have this here. And so the, the use of stereotomy enabled us to construct these sorts of edifices. And one great example of stereotomy installing staircase construction is this one out of the Eggenberg Palace in Graz, Austria. It was built in 1460. And it's this double revolving staircase that comes up and meets together at, at, at different height floors. So there's a, kind of a plan view of it. And here's a kind of loose, here's another shot of it looking at it from the side. Yeah, so built in the 1400s. Uh, again, this is one of those little like architectural masterpieces out of nowhere comes this with this thing and then you know, disappear. So the person, there must have been someone, some genius at the time that figured it out. And they were able to carve that out. So, you know, if you're, make, you're taking this solid material of stone and making it look like Play-Doh. You know, you can do absolutely anything you want to it. So you, un, you have a holistic understanding of the material, the properties, the tools, how to cut it, how to carve it, how to assemble it, how to raise it. It's like you take a 3D printer today or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So here's another undershot of that staircase. The, 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 the palace itself, nothing, nothing real super fancy about it, but it's just a staircase. This, uh, check, if you Google it, stair, the stairs of reconciliation is what it's called. Yeah, I think you probably want to be sober going up and down those things. <laughs> and so like I kind of mentioned earlier, stereotomy enabled us to build these arches, vaults, all this stuff, but there was also a military application to it. And in fact, in, uh, in the 1700s, France declared stereotomy as a military secret for its ability to build star forts. And it wasn't until 17, about 1799, well, since 1799, the French government declassified it. And then now it went back into the kind of public domain. And then in, in the early 1800s, we started to see these schools of stereotomy prop up. They started teaching it because now it's in the public world again. When was it declassified? 1799. Yeah. And because before before that time, learning stereotomy was was often a, was restricted to your a master. If one person you want to learn, you got to go to this person. And then it kind of in France, anyways, it gets a, a military secret. So now you can't you can't teach it. Uh, and then in 1799, then it's like okay, now it's open to the public. And so then now people and just anyone with the knowledge start teaching it basically. Um, because in 1799, I believe they had or before that, had high-powered artillery that can just blast through any you know, thickness of walls. So that's why they didn't need it anymore. Yeah, the star force became obsolete. So now the next part of the presentation is are these schools starting to prop up? So in the early 1800s, schools dedicated to the sole understanding of stereotomy. So here's, uh, and you can see in, in some of these photos, there was often military personnel involved, engineers, architects because they still had this military application for building bridges or you know, stuff like that. But some of the younger people you see here, uh, maybe part of the trades, or too young to be in the military. This is one of the schools in France. This is the uh, Maison Paternelle, the École de Stereotomy. So the School of Stereotomy applied to construction. This place still exists. You can actually Google map it, and you can see and find uh, this wild looking dormer. So stereotomy was in fact taught into, uh, to architects in the Beaux Art schools in the 1800s. So they would learn, so architects would learn how to carve stone, you know, sculptings, and then you can see in the background there are all the different arches, arch types, different intersections. So we have French architects learning about stereotomy. We have, here's, uh, I think some Italian architects learning about stereotomy. And then certainly within the trade themselves, like the trade unions and the carpenters, they would run a stereotype. So in this case, we would build roofs 
but it's still that idea of forms and triangles all coming together. The most famous school of them all was, was by this man here. Yeah, uh, Pierre Francois Guillaume, so this guy in the top right. And he has he had his school up until 1910, right before the World War I broke out, when he passed away. It's now a museum in a small little town called Romanesh Thoren. And you go check it out, and I, if you're ever in the, <coughs> the world, go check it out. It's, like, it's, it's amazing. It's really it's awesome to see. Because a lot of his work is still there. So here's some of his photos of the students. And often his students became architects. They went on and became quite well known in their, in their respective fields. And in the museum today, it's still you can see these photos. You can still this masterpiece still exists. This piece still is there. Some in the background are still there. You can go and you can touch them and you can see them. Right, how are we doing on time? Okay, so we got now. All right, okay, so now I've, I've introduced kind of the history of stereotomy. We had, like, way back from the, yeah, it's 500,000 years ago, the Egyptians, Roman, blah, 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 into the schools of stereotomy. Now I want to show you uh, that today, stereotomy is still taught and practiced by mainly three cultures, three nations, the French, the German, and the Japanese. And so I want to sh just show you how they treat stereotypes, how they train and teach the younger apprentices coming through. So I'll first start off with the Japanese. The Meideku, which are the Japanese carpet, uh, temple carpenters, palace carpenters, and they have a school. If you, I don't know what it says, but if you look up this place, they got a Facebook page, social media, uh, you can find them. And from what I understand is that part of their training they have to, if you want to work on some of these listed monuments and buildings, you have to go through this training and obtain you know, that level of certification. And so they, in, through the training, they build these models. So here's some of them uh, learning and training. Uh, the Japanese government did, has this really interesting uh, concept or idea in that, so this man here, um, his name is Mochida Takayo, and he is a living national treasure. So in Japan, you can get this classification or whatever of a living national treasure. And they have this for tra like multiple traits, not just carpentry, but basket weaving, painting, uh, you name it. I don't know. I don't know all the, the, the traits pottery, uh, tile making for roofs, uh, all that sort of stuff. And so he has this, this, this certification or whatever it is for, for two forms of stereotomy. And in Japan, uh, like the French and the Germans, they have a word specific for stereotomy as it's used by carpenters. And the Japanese word is called kikujutsu. Kikujutsu, from what I understand. And so this man has that title of, of modern and ancient uses or techniques of kikujutsu. And so now the government funds him, gives him a monthly salary or something like this, and he'll train younger apprentices so he puts on workshops where they'll teach and learn of stereotomy. And I believe that according to when I was in Japan, um, they were telling me that the, 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 the development of stereotomy enabled them to develop this swooping eaves line. Not in Japan, they, they say this knowledge came from China when the Buddhist monks came over in 450 or something like that. Um, yeah. So the carpenters are learning how can we solve and lay out for all these curves, you know, the swooping roofs on the pagodas, the temples. So I was able to get a few shots of, their, of them working away in, in the school. So here's that drawing. I don't know everything about it, but I would imagine that here you have an elevation view of the rafters, and, and multiple rafters swooping up. Uh, look at the pearl in here. And then here you have what looks to, to me like a, uh, an elevation view of the fascia, or that, or, that, or that curved purlin component. And the rest of the stuff I'm not really sure. 
And so through their training, they have to create these models. And it's taken very seriously. You know, if you want to get to that level of, you know, of sophistication or that level of, of hierarchy, uh, the expectation is that you go through this. And you can see in the model, there's two ways that they solve for the overhang in the corner where the, you know, the hip, where you have this one technique of this radiating rafters coming out, uh, and this other technique that we're kind of used to where the rafters are just square from the top plate. And basically the last, maybe, you know, certainly the last one, but maybe the reason the last, the, the, the last two, aren't, not, they're just for show, nothing's supporting it. So to overcome that, if you radiate it out, all the rafters are being supported by the top plate of the curve. And so for them, it's a, it's, these are moments that are taken very seriously and uh, you want to be, you want to pass this. And so they have these kind of competitions too a little bit, but once, once you finish your model, they get highly critiqued and judged and looked at. So there's, uh, there's Machida Takeo here and his students and, I, and looking at their models. <coughs> So I was able to get a few shots of the model, and then their stool, the splay blade stool that they do. And a few of these shots. Plan views. Uh, there's that swooping purlin. Other side. Close ups. I don't know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe he made a mistake, there's two lines there, so, it's not good. Yeah. I bet you it's the inside of the house. Yeah, maybe, yeah, exactly, who knows, I don't know. Possible. Uh, and there's the other side, so that's what you can, you know, in, those, in, in that form of architecture, you can see those, the underside, that's what you often see in the like, structure. Um, one of the interesting things, you know, of course, the Japanese are well known for the joinery, and how intricate and complicated and how tight they can make them, but, if I was to look at where this is, so this is like kind of your, your main hip component, where the hip gets into, there's a post on the other side of this leg, where that hip meets into the post, they have this through tendon, I'll show you, there it is. Oh, man. So this wedge, or this peg, square peg through tendon. Um, so, you see that? You see those? Those are screws. <laughs> we tend to romanticize a lot about you know metal hardware or some sort of pure joinery or something like this. Yeah, there's another shot of it. Yeah, so the so you with the support that you just carry, I'm going to be able to figure out what are the what's the angle of the peg coming in the face of the pin post and what's the layout for the through tenant of that tip. And so they have, one of the things they'll do, it, and the French and the Germans do this as well, is they'll have this line here on the tenon, and then you have that same line up, it's this meeting line, these two lines where they meet. Uh, and that's, that's a reference line. Now, as soon as they, those two lines meet, then that's where it goes. You can't go anywhere else. Regardless of everything else, like if there's a gap in the joint, you can't fix it. The lines meet up and that's where it goes. So when the joint's nice and tight, uh, and, funnel, and these lines match up, you can have, maybe appreciate the amount of time, and effort, and skill is required to do that, which is a lot. And so this, the use of this, the, the way that they use stereotomy enables them to preserve and construct these sorts of, this sort of architecture. And so not only do they use it for the swooping portion of, of the pagodas, and temples, but also all of this bracketing system underneath that supports that overhang. So here's a close up of it. So they'll make, from, from what I've seen when I was there, they'll make a full scale drawing of that. And then that's how they obtain all their angles, their true lengths, true widths of their pieces. And what this does for them like it does the French and the German, is enables them to preserve and to keep their architectural, cultural landscape. So when we go to Japan, we can admire these buildings that have been around for 
thousand years because they have the skill and ability and they're still being taught how to preserve it. And I think that's wonderful. And so not only are they using it for the preservation uh, and, and restoration of their structures, but also for new construction. Where again, you see how the swooping curlins. And all the joinery that Bill employed, you know, corn in there or whatever, and the screws. <laughs> um, and so here's a couple of examples of just some of the architecture that they, that they do. Yeah, so here's, uh, all right. so there's the Japanese. Uh, I'm going to show you now the, the German side. So the Zimmermans. So uh, I'm sure people have heard of the Zimmermans. Uh, Zimmerman is uh, carpenter in German. Zimmer is uh, room, space, man, uh, maker. So something like this. And the direct translation is like a room maker or something. And so the Germans have this, like, like the Japanese and like the French, they have this lengthy tradition and culture of the trade that goes far back. So I was able to find some of these old photos of the, some of the Germans. And in Germany, like France and I believe in Japan, they have uh, le levels of certification that one can obtain to open your own business, operate as a carpenter. Uh, unlike in America here, we can't just, you can't just go to Home Depot, buy a toolbox, and say, I'm a carpenter, so that's going to hammer. I mean, you have to go through a levels of, of training. And so in Germany, they have this Meisterbrief, uh, which now enables them to open their company and, and employ apprentices or train apprentices. So the, the Germans also, you can see they have this very specific heavy suit, and there's a lot of history behind that suit. Um, with the number of buttons, the tight, you know, the, the, the mother of pearl buttons, the, the, the zippers and the bell bottom pants and all this stuff. But um, again, that the Germans practice stereotomy and enables them to keep their cultural, their architectural cultural landscape. You know, through their rest project for restoration. Germans, and then uh, now the French. So this is the system that I went through, so I have a little bit more information about them than I do the other two. But the French, um, you could start uh, as early as I believe 14 years old in the trade. And their system, you know, from the very beginning to the very end is on average 10 years long. So you'll finish your, you know, you become a compagnon or whatever when you're around the ages of 24, 25, 26, 27, somewhere around there. And so here are some modern photos of apprentices, journeymen, uh, and compagnons uh, coming together, presenting their, their masterpiece or their, you know, what's called an adoption piece. So within the French system, if you want to partake as a journeyman, you have to present an adoption piece. And that's some of the simpler models that we see in this photo. And so once you, you create your piece, you present it to the board of compagnons, uh, they can accept or deny it. But if it's accepted, now you become an aspirant, an aspirant, a journeyman. That's what we would see it as. And then now you start this, this lengthy, arduous Tour de France phase. And this Tour de France lasts about seven, eight years long, where you're literally traveling around France and into parts of Europe for different companies, and you're living and working like this monastic lifestyle. And so within the French, uh, the, if I was to describe it, because we don't have anything like it, okay? So it's not American here, and it's very different for us as, as, as our mindset and our cultural identity to, to try to impose, or maybe, you know, it's not like this, so it's not as good or something like this. But um, the French have, uh, a mixture of a military kind of strictness to it, where you're living all together in a guild house, living, and we all sleep in the same room in bunk beds, like like boot, like boot camp, and you do this, and you're living like that for several years, and you all eat together at the same time, uh, from seven to eight. If you miss supper, too, good luck, you go hungry, uh, and then study period is from eight to ten, mandatory. If you're missing too many of those days, if you're going to ask me why, then you're up. Uh, and so you've got a bit of this military kind of characteristics of it, this very square, boxed-in lifestyle. And then uh, it also mixes in, of course, with the trade and the timber framing, and uh, this obsessiveness about the trade. So all you do and all you talk about is carpentry. And of course, there's a lot of men, so then women sometimes. 
Um, so you don't know anything else. So when these, when these young people get involved at 14 years old, you don't know anything else. And especially when you're at like 25 near the end of it, that's all, that's all you know. And so you don't know what life is like outside of the system. Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to put your mind into it. But my time there, it was, I, I went in a little later, and so I had some life experiences, and I'm saying a lot, some. And it was very challenging for me in the beginning to adopt this idea, this mentality, of all you talk about is carpentry. All you talk about is stereotypy. Uh, masterpieces, these buildings, these architectural details at this city and that city, and this company, that's all you do. Um, because that is, it's, it's like, it's, it kills you. It's like, do you know that there's like a thing called sports or something? You know, like, you know, like other things of life? No, you know, it's carpentry. Uh, so the military strictness, uh, purely trade, obsessive orientation, and then they have this other mix of what we would make, see as Freemasonry. As what? Freemasonry, Freemasons, you know, with like ceremonies and rituals. So there's the companions that have, you have ritualistic, like so if you, when, you, when you get from apprentice to a journeyman, there's a ceremony and a ritual that you go through, and then you get this like sash and a cane, and then when you get from journeyman to, you know, master, you take that lightly, but uh, companions, there's another ceremony that you go through. And then at the very end of it all, there's a final ceremony. Get the hat. Get the hat, yeah. So here's some, uh, just some modern examples of, of these young, young people doing the Tour de France, celebrating. They celebrate uh, St. Joseph Day, or the day of St. Joseph, his birthday, March 17th. And so here you see them, them presenting their masterpieces. And so like, like the Japanese and the, the Germans, the, the French, through the development of the stereotomy stuff, it enabled them to create a unique architectural landscape in that uh, the French have, they developed this type of dormer called a guitar. And this dormer is, is unique to France, um, where it has these different curves to it. You know, the three-dimensionally curved pieces. And again, like the French, oh, like the German, the Japanese, the French, it, they, they preserve, they're able to preserve their architectural landscape. And like I mentioned earlier with this, that architect, Philippe uh, he, he was that, he's, Philippe Bertolome in the 1500s, he's like the French Renaissance architect. He's like the guy that invented it. And he was well known for creating these forms here, called in France, in Tom, or a trumpet, or something like that, a switch. Um, so we can see some of that, the, the stone stereotype in there. Another thing that the French do uh, are these twisted steeples. Uh, unique, the, the Germans do it too, but mostly in France you'll find these guitars and these twisted steeples. That, you know, there's a whole story behind them. They think maybe it was done intentionally or the devil did it or something. But uh, now, now they, they do them intentionally. And so we, you often see them as, like, as being displayed as a, as a master. And as everyone knows, there was the great fire of this cathedral that burnt. Um, and this is what they do. I'm not saying they burn cathedrals, but they, they were able to construct their, their, their architecture uh, all the time. They have the knowledge, they have the know-how, they have the skills, they have some trees, they have the wood, they have all that. Um, so I find it fascinating that they, they, they can keep that alive. Here's some of these masterpieces there. This is uh, one. In the 60s, there's a spire of Violina Duc and the heart transit, I guess, and a, car and a timber frame of carpentry. And here's a modern one that was done, I believe, in 2021. And again, they're using this, this notion of, of drawing things out on the, on the floor, on the ground. So here they are there. Those are, those are, those are the three. Uh, journeymen that now have become fully inducted members. There's their supervisor, Copagnol. Um, he watches them, monitors, and makes sure that what they're doing is good, and the stereotomy behind it, and, uh, and the drawing, and you know, it's justified. Oops. Uh, and then I'll end that this portion of, of these these three different cultures that still practice and maintain stereotomy with, with this. So, uh, in this book called The Glass Page, Automation and Us. The author, Nicholas Carr, discusses a fascinating uh, area of neuroscience research called embodied cognition. 
Uh, and he explains that science has found that the workings of the brain and body are interwoven to a degree far beyond what we assume or what we know. The biological processes that constitute thinking emerge not just from neural complications in the skull, but from actions and sensory perceptions of the entire body. Basically, from what I understand, thinking occurs not only in your brain, but in your body as well, like in your hands. Um, and he continues to say, uh, so he gives the retina, the eye as an example, and says it's not, it isn't a passive sensor sending raw data to the brain, as we once assumed, it actively shapes what we see. The eye has its smarts of its own. We continue, and he says, uh, the idea that our understanding of our surroundings is formed not only in our brains, but throughout our whole bodies as consequential for a relationship with our tools. Carr explains that, quote, our bodies and brains are quick to bring tools and other artifacts into our thought processes, to treat things neurologically as part of ourselves. So if you walk with a cane, or work with a hammer, or fight with a sword, your brain will incorporate the tools into its neuronal map of your body. In some ways, if people would use their chisel, it's like an extension of your hand, right? You, can, you just have that feeling, because your brain has adopted neurons that this is part of your body. Okay, so we, uh, I think we have maybe 10 minutes left or so. It's four, uh, four. five minutes till noon. Okay, cool, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, flip, I'm gonna blow through this next portion of the presentation. Um, I try, in this portion, of the, I'll just briefly go through it. In this portion of the presentation, I try to explain why we don't have this knowledge in America, what happened to it, and basically, there's a lot of stuff that occurred that prevented us from really uh, obtaining it and, and flourishing with it, and, and you know, that sort of stuff. So, in, in the 1600s, there was the divergence of architects and craftsmen with Beaux-Art schools, uh, the idea of Beaux-Art schools. Uh, the Industrial Revolution had this big impact of society, uh, the invention of, not the invention, but the application of the assembly line procedure with the prescriptive technology. Uh, of course, then World War I completely destroyed Europe, and then shortly after that, so World War II uh, destroyed it again. And so that Europe was no longer in the phase of creating and evolving, they now big step back. Uh, now we have to repair and keep, you know get back to our, back to what we were before. And then in America, we we just sort of developed this sort of this style of home of track homes. And you know, with the vehicle and the invention of the vehicle, suburbia. Right? And then now it's like, if you want to build a house, don't do anything other than this two by four system, conventional lumber. Uh, you know, don't do anything that we can't make out of this assembly line procedure, right? We need this technology to develop this. And so similarly, architects and designers adopted then this idea of this assembly line thing where, you know, as an architect, we just keep dropping the same thing, the pile block, whatever. Uh, so it's, the mentalities are, it became very different than what it was before that. And then of course then, the invention of AutoCAD, SketchUp, where now we're purely into the digital world, no longer in using our hands, as Nicholas Carr strongly suggests that we use our hands to, to learn. Um, educational system, how the, basically how the educational system employs just the cycle of, uh, of people, of this assembly line procedure. Yeah. Uh, and for, for carpenters, we created this really wonderful tool, the framing square, but if you want to do anything, if you want to do a hip or wrap or anything outside the norm that this tool can't do, you're stuck, you know, then forget about it. So, yeah, so there's, there's that part. Okay, so I'll, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up with why it's important to learn by doing it by hand. So um, to get to that, I'll give you this quote. If you can't picture in your mind, how can you bring it to life? So both the study of stereotomy and hand drafting can, will and can physically change the way your brain thinks and sees. So there was a study done fairly recently, I think in 2015, about handwriting versus typing notes. Uh, so Pam Mueller and Dan Oppenheimer did this study with students. They wanted to see how note taking affects learning. And so they have, they took two forms, two types of students, ones that typed, ones that took notes by hand. And what they discovered was, of course, the people who took typed notes, they were able to type, they just basically copy what the professor was saying. Their brains weren't processing the information, uh, they had a lot of notes that they could reference to in their free time, but they didn't really understand the material. Whereas the people handwriting, what they discovered 
was that they couldn't write as fast as the guy was, the person was talking. So they had to synthesize and try to understand and then make point form notes of what the teacher was talking about. So they had, the brain was working, they had a better understanding of the material. And what that really, what that really uh, showed at the end was in exam time. Come exam time, the people who took notes by hand were far better off. And so that's one of the reasons why I strongly recommend that when learning something, you know, do it first by hand. It doesn't mean you have to do it for the rest of your life, but your brain and your whole body has this better understanding of the material, the concepts, and how things work. And so there's this guy named Jake Weedman, who if there's a TED talk, and I highly recommend you look at look, why write? Why do we need to write? And why it's important for kids to write and, and the relationship of writing and reading. And so this is um, this is the end here. By learning this stuff manually, by learning stereotype manually, it's what psychologists over time consider a transformative experience. That you, you get, kind of get to a point where you now start seeing the world differently. I'm not saying you see it very differently, but you get to see it how form and function and, and things collide with one another. And so you, you, it's like a, the, the best example of a transformative experience is like having kids. You know, your life before having kids and life after your kids are very different. And the way you take actions and, and respond to things or you make choices are very different. So, yeah, that's form of experience. All right, there it is. Wow. Yes, sir.